Good evening. Welcome to the Secretary of State Candidate Forum. This program is part of a series brought to you by The Bridge and Orca Media to help voters get to know their candidates better. I'm Cassandra Hemingway. I'm the managing editor of The Bridge and this evening's moderator. Um, a little bit about these forums before we introduce the candidates. These forums were intended to provide the candidates an opportunity to share their views and explain why they think they should be elected. It is not a debate, so candidates will not be asking, questioning each other. Um, before introducing the two candidates we have with us tonight, I will review the format. We, will, we have asked the public to um, send us their questions, so we've incorporated some questions from the community um, into our list here tonight, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, during this program, we'll also be taking call-in questions. And if you would like to call in, send uh, call 802-224-9901. That number is 802-224-9901. Each candidate will have two minutes at the opening of this program to um, introduce themselves and explain why they're running. After that, they'll have a minute and a half to answer each of our questions. Um, and if there's a need for a rebuttal, that's at the moderator's discretion. For the opening statements, I'll call candidates in order, alphabetical order by last name, and then we'll switch back and forth between who starts first. So I'd like to introduce Sarah Copeland Hansas, the Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, and H. Brooke Page, the Republican candidate. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Sarah, would you like to start with your opening statement? Great, thank you so much. So I'm Sarah Copeland Hansis. I hail from Bradford, grew up in Corinth, graduated from Oxbow High School and the University of Vermont. Uh, I spent a couple years as a middle school teacher before I had the wonderful opportunity to stay home with my kids for eight years. Um, at that, during that time, I stayed involved with young people through coaching and volunteering in the community. Um, and then a group of community members asked me to run for the house. So uh, I ran for the House in 2004, uh, was sworn in in 2005, and have served in the House representing Bradford Fairley and West Fairley uh, for 18 years. Um, my, uh, my committee background in the House was a decade or so on the Health Care Committee, um, and most recently as chair of the Government Operations Committee. And the Government Operations Committee oversees um, all of the functions of the Secretary of State's office. And so it was uh, through the work that we've done in uh, streamlining the Office of Professional Regulation, in um, putting voter accessibility at the forefront of our election reforms, that I got really excited about the role of Secretary of State. And so when Secretary Condos announced that he was going to step down, um, I started thinking about it. Thank you. Brooke. Yes. Time for your opening statement. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brooke Page, and I'm from the town of Washington, Vermont. And um, my wife and I moved up to Vermont, oh my gosh, 1987. And uh, I wanted to get her away from the, um, the big city life. We, li we lived in, outside of Philadelphia, and uh, we had been married, I guess, about 10 or 12 years at that time, and things were really not going well where we lived. It was, uh, uh, we lived in a nice little apartment building. We had been s uh, saving all our money up to eventually move up to Vermont and had been buying property in Washington. Uh, we'd bought it a couple years sooner, so uh, we were very glad to get our home up here to Vermont, but unfortunately I was working in Philadelphia, and so for the next 27 years I commuted back and forth every week uh, I've been involved, especially since I retired. I, I retired because I almost died from congestive heart failure, which is now fully resolved. But um, anyway, so since I've been moving up here, I've gotten involved a little bit in politics. Um, my main concerns uh, were the problem with open primaries and all the mischief that that causes in our elections. And that's how I became interested in the Secretary of State's office. Uh, and so I've run for Secretary of State and some other offices uh, along the way, in large part trying to make the point that we should have closed primaries where the parties get to make their own choices for their candidates rather than having it be this kind of um, ruffian fight uh, where everybody gets to vote 
uh, for any, in every, any party in the primary, and anybody can run for any office in the primary. And so I guess that's it. We'll get to more of this later, but I'm excited about becoming Vermont's next Secretary of State. Okay, thank you. Well, let's get into the questions, and maybe some of them will touch on that topic. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to start this next question with Brooke and then Sarah. And uh, first I'll give you the context of, and then the question. Okay. Um, so election integrity. Elections have been under scrutiny. Here in Montpelier, a citizen recounted election results from the 2020 general election just a few weeks ago, almost two years later. Um, the Secretary of State's office has had a large number of records requests, not only for recounts, but also and primarily for voting machine data um, just recently, in the late summer, early fall. So my question is, is election integrity under attack? Do you believe the Secretary of State office needs to focus more attention on election security? And if so, what actions do you propose? I think nationwide, there's a lot of outstanding questions about exactly what's going on. And I think the uh, 2020 election created additional problems in that emergency activities were begun because of COVID that in many states weren't even constitutional under normal circumstances. And, and that may be said of some of the things that happened here in Vermont. But as far as the integrity of the election, fortunately for us, the most, Im the most important people involved are the town clerks and the members of the uh, Board of Civil Authority. And it's under their scrutiny that the uh, election is actually operated. And I think almost universally that the local people voting have confidence in the members of the Board of Civil Authority and in their town clerks. So I don't think we have the kind of problems that go on elsewhere. That doesn't mean that there's a perception, not the perception that there's a problem. And in my mind, that's the biggest problem with this, is many people hear about the larger issues nationwide and somehow attempt to place them you know, uh, uh, as being problems here in Vermont. And Mr. Condos, by saying, oh, we never have any problems here. There's no election fraud in the Vermont. And instead of trying to prove the point, only fosters the concerns. And that's the biggest problem now is folks are becoming dissuaded from being involved in the process or, and voting. OK. Thank you, Brooke. Over. <laughs> Sarah. So um, I, I remember the, the run-up to the question, but could you repeat the two-part question that you asked? Yes, and um, is election integrity under attack? And do you believe the Secretary of State office needs to focus more attention on election security? And if so, what actions do you propose? Great. Um, so yes, it is clear that election integrity is under attack. Um, and watching the, uh, the repetitiveness of this message, uh, over and over again about um, stolen elections and, uh, and, and misinformation about voter fraud uh, really does play into that narrative. And um, what I know in Vermont is that our elections um, are kept safe in part because we have 246 uh, duly elected or appointed uh, town or city clerks whose job it is to uphold democracy and to conduct elections um, that, uh, that I think have uh, very clear procedures um, and very clear uh, guidelines for what to do in the event of a, an irregularity. Um, now, I'm, I am not uh, at all going to rest on my laurels about whether our elections are secure. Um, I will uh, bring together a town clerk advisory committee in part so that I have a, a collection of town clerks from different parts of the state, from big towns and small, to, to give me sort of a, a, a front row view of how elections are working for them. I will also bring together a cybersecurity task force that um, Montpelier City Clerk John Odom is helping to advise me on. Uh, and we will make sure that we kick the tires um, and make sure we do everything that we need to to keep our elections secure. Thank you. Okay, so this next question, Sarah, I'll ask you first and then Brooke. Um, and the context for this one is voter turnout. Um, Vermont looks like it's doing pretty well with voter turnout when you compare it to voter turnout nationally. 
in the 2018 general election. Um, data on the Secretary of State's website says that 54.6% um, of voters turned out in Vermont compared to 53.4 nationally. And um, in the, let's see, general election in 63.3% compared to 61.4% nationally turned out for the 2016 election, just for comparison. Um, so the question is, um, do you regard those numbers as adequate? Um, and even though Vermont only slightly surpasses national voter turnout averages, and please explain why or why not. So, you know, when you live in a democracy, the point of a democracy is that everyone gets to have a say, right? And so ideally, we would have 100% participation. And I know that there are a lot of reasons why sometimes people don't participate. Um, many of them I've heard from voters uh, over my 18 years running for my House seat. Uh, so that kind of feedback informs what I will do if elected Secretary of State. Um, and you know, the first thing that I want to do is make sure that when you receive your November general election ballot in the mail, you also get a voter guide. When, when candidates register to, to be on the ballot, they already give the Secretary of State's office their contact information, their website, their social media handles. Uh, we can require them also to f submit 100 words, uh, you know, why are you running for this office and what will you do if elected? And um, I think that that will go a long way to empowering people to vote because you have 45 days with your ballot and you will have a voter guide and you can spend that time figuring out who you want to vote for. It's really intimidating to try to figure that out in three to five minutes in, uh, you know, in the voting booth on election day. And so I think that the opportunity um, for strengthening our democracy through universal vote by mail and a voter guide is going to be very powerful. Thank you. Brooke. Okay. I think the important part of democracy as we practice it here in the United States is the um, ability of people to vote or not vote as they see fit. You know, uh, Russia, China, they have elections where everybody is commanded to vote. And so when I've been out and about, there's a significant portion of the people that do not want to get involved in politics, either just because they have no interest or in many cases because, be, because they've become uh, dissuaded uh, from participating. They think that something's wrong with the process or that the elections are, are rigged. And so the biggest thing in my mind is to convince as many people as we can of the importance of their vote and the honesty and integrity of the election process. Uh, you know, I, I think that citizens also have a responsibility to inform themselves through the media about who the candidates are and, and what the election is all about. And to um, spoon feed it to them through the through Secretary of State's office may be inappropriate that the, the media at large, just like what we're doing here, uh, should be the forum where, where citizens find out about the candidates and find out about the process. And uh, you know, I think that's the most important part. And it, I think it's very important to vote in person versus all of this universal mail going on that we have Thank going on you. currently. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, OK, I appreciate both of your answers. And we're going to move on to the next question, starting with Brooke for this one. Um, this question is actually about a comment you made, Sarah, during uh, VT Digger forum in the primaries, um, where you talked about wanting to hire an outreach person should you become the Secretary of State. Um, there's a lot of misinformation circulating to the point that the Secretary of State website actually has a myth versus fact page mm -hmm. to address some of that. Um, so my question is for both of you, do you think the Secretary of State does need an outreach person on staff, and why or why not? OK, I did, before we start my time, uh, outreach person in what, as far as elections? I, I didn't see the article. Somebody who would um, go be an outreach 
do outreach to the community, to schools, to the around the state, informing people about what the Secretary of State's office does. Okay, I got you. Uh, the, I'm sorry, that your, wasn't your clear. Your question and, and, <laughs> and how I see the, see the answer is a little bit different. I think that what Sarah may have been talking about is something I've talked about for a very long time, and that's when Jim um, Douglas and Deb Markowitz were in the Secretary of State's office, there was a specific education outreach individual who was responsible for uh, trying to promote civics and governance instruction uh, within the schools. And I, th I think, you know, if I, if, when I'm elected, uh, if I'm elected, uh, that I would certainly want to reestablish that. A lot of the materials still float around from when Jim Douglas and uh, Deb Markowitz were in the office. And, and they, while they probably need to be updated a little bit, I think it, it's very important. Uh, for the Secretary of State in all of the all the hats that the Secretary of State wears, uh, not only in elections but also in uh, uh, the um, archives responsibilities. Uh, there's we, the archives has a vast treasure trove of materials that are kind of locked away, and I think that it would be important as part of that outreach person's responsibilities to try to circulate and and uh, promote those materials and hmm. maybe ha have them restored and displayed. Thank you. Yep. Sarah. So yes, I think it's really important for the Secretary of State's office to resume that education and outreach coordinator um, role. The, the idea that uh, young people are graduating from high school without ever having had um, a, a class in civics, a class in how democracy functions is, uh, is, is I think, part of what plays into the misinformation uh, that is running rampant. If you don't understand how government works, you're susceptible to lies about stolen elections. And so I want to make sure that that education and outreach coordinator is somebody who can come in, who can work with a group of teacher advisors, teachers in the classroom now from pre-K all the way through high school who can say this is what a relevant curriculum would look like or this is what we need uh, to, to be helpful and accessible to, uh, to our fellow teachers and to our students. That's phase one. Phase two, though, is recognizing that we have a whole generation of people who either didn't have civics or, uh, like me, graduated long enough ago that they may have forgotten a few of their civics lessons. I want to make sure that we're getting out and engaging with those people as well. Because the purpose of a democracy is that if you have a challenge or a problem that you see in, that other people are also experiencing and you can't fix it on your own, you should be able to petition your government to help with that. Maybe it's get out of the way, but to help with that. I want to empower people to know how to do democracy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I actually, um, well, I was going to skip ahead to another question, but um, I think because most of my questions focus on the election, I'm going to skip ahead to um, a question that kind of talks a little bit more about the other roles of the Secretary of State. Then we'll get back to elections questions. Um, so Sarah, we'll start with you for this question. Um, so the Secretary of State oversees Vermont archives, as you mentioned, Brooke, um, and records requests. Um, oh my goodness, I skipped to the wrong question. Here it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, elections, of course, the Office of Professional Regulation, which is a whole other part we haven't talked about, corporations, et cetera. Um, we have focused and we will continue to focus on elections tonight, but I'd like to just hear from you both about um, the specific functions in the Secretary of State role that you believe need changes or that you think are working well and you'd like to keep going the way they're going um, in mm -hmm. some of these other roles. And okay. Sarah, we'll start with you. So broadly across all of the departments. Okay, I'm gonna start with corporations um, because very early on in the campaign trail, I happened across someone who started a business during the pandemic. And so I said, great, tell me how the Secretary of State's uh, business portal worked for you. Um, and she gave me some really good feedback. Um, and, uh, and that feedback was, uh, depending on the 
kind of corporation you are trying to register, it goes really smoothly. But in fact, I had to drive to Montpelier in the middle of a pandemic um, to to exchange my paperwork uh, in person, which just felt really weird. Um, and so what I want to do in the corporations division is, uh, is get in there and get a listing of businesses that have started up, because we've had a lot of turnover of businesses closing and new ones opening in the last two years. I want to, I want to talk with them and say, how, how's it working for you? What can we do better? Um, with respect to the state archives, it is a treasure trove of important and critical information um, that, that documents the history of the state of Vermont. I want to make sure that we're giving our state archives uh, the resources that they need in order to be able to uh, adapt to the digital era. You know, it used to be when there was a, a stack of file boxes, you would say, oh man, I really need to go through those and, and pull out just the things that are important to keep and, and leave out the memo about the Christmas party. Um, we're not doing that as diligently as we should be uh, in the electronic era, and so that's one of the reforms that I'd like to bring. And I'll be happy to talk about OPR a little bit later. I bet we'll get back to it. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, I, I kind of view uh, OPR, uh, Office of Professional Regulation, and corporations kind of in the same lens. Um, uh, I think there's far fewer problems in corporations than there are in OPR. I have a number of friends of mine in the business community who have been damaged by OPR's regulatory um, overreach, if you like, uh, people who I know to be good, honest business people, one of whom wound up having to retire because he became um, so mired in the process that he couldn't practice his trade, which was surveying for over two years and eventually threw up in his hands and gave up. I think a big part of some of the other problems I've heard, beyond the fact that OPR has kind of become the sea creature with, with tentacles weaving itself out into so much of the um, uh, uh, commerce of the state, that um, we really need to take a look at who's regulating those businesses. Over half of the professions on the OPR list are in fact medical or health related. Everything from uh, chiropractors and, and nurse practitioners to uh, barbers, beauticians, tattoo artists. And it really strikes me that neither I nor Jim Condos, nor possibly even Sarah, unless she has some additional talents I don't know about, are really not the ideal people to be uh, overseeing those offices. And so I think that's a big issue to be looked at. Uh, we'll talk more about archives, where I've had some personal experience in a few moments and, and the troubles that are over there. I'm sorry, I have to stop you, Brooke. We're I over know you time. did. I, I just, you were just going to keep talking no, until no, no, I, I said over. over and I, to, <laughs> I wasn't about to wrap until I saw okay. the clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I realize that was a very broad question with only a minute and a half to answer. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, I actually want to skip over to um, a question that goes back to the town clerks you both talked about. Um, and not just town clerks, but all of the people who are involved in holding elections. We're going back to elections. Um, so, and we'll start with Brooke for this okay. question and then go to Sarah. Um, so given the violence and threats against election workers across the country, how would you protect and maintain an adequate pool of nonpartisan poll workers in our state? Okay, well, I think, you know, we can't really put Vermonters in the same bucket with the folks from Philadelphia or Chicago or, you know, uh, New York, that I think we have a much more civil atmosphere here and in general and in, in addition uh, in elections. And so I'm hopeful that we don't have those kinds of troubles. Uh, my biggest concern with poll watchers right now is that with the new universal vote by mail and the early opening of ballots and all of this, uh, there's so many opportunities where the ballots are being opened and separated, that it's difficult for poll watchers from each uh, party to actually be involved and watch the, um, the uh, balloting process. And that's a problem. You know, we, we suddenly, instead of having an election day, which is mandated by our Constitution, uh, chapter 2, Articles 43 and 44, if I remember correctly, where it says the election shall be held on the first Tuesday after the first Monday. 
in November. And so it doesn't say we can have election season. It doesn't have we can have election month. It, it's a specific day. And it's important to remember all of this early voting and people being chided to vote early, get it out of the way, really is really uh, encouraging people to vote before they have a full knowledge of who the candidates are and what the issues are. And I think that's somewhat toxic towards getting the best outcome as far as informed voters. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Sarah. So um, one of the first topics that I want to talk to my town clerk advisory group about is what are you seeing, what are you experiencing, and what do you need? Um, I think it's very important uh, in terms of protection of our democracy that these uh, citizens who uh, who've stepped up to run for the job of town clerk in order to help us safely conduct our democracy, um, they need to feel protected when they are um, holding elections. I know they feel supported right now uh, because by and large every town clerk that I talk to says, yes, I, I get an e email back immediately, yes, they answer the phone, they call back on election day, you know, I'm getting the support that I need. Uh, but I also want to make sure that we are giving these important civil servants um, any other support that they might need. Thank you. Okay, so this next question, uh, we start with Sarah. I'm just going to keep flipping back and forth. The context, first the context of this question is um, this: the organization uh, Campaign Legal is the name of the organization, has issued a paper addressing foreign influence on U.S. elections. In it, they state that nearly $1 billion in secret money, known as dark money, has been spent on U.S. elections over the past decade. The Mueller report, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, found that Russian government, the Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in a, quote, sweeping and systemic fashion and violated U.S. criminal law. The question for you both is, do we need to improve our existing cybersecurity measures to limit foreign interference with our elections? And we'll start with Sarah. Um, yes, it is um, a race without a finish line, I think, is, uh, is the way Secretary Condos has always put it. And, and I agree, because uh, we might think we're secure today, um, but we don't know what's coming at us uh, tomorrow. Um, and so, yes, I will continue to focus on uh, cybersecurity of our elections. Uh, our tabulators are not connected to the Internet, and we need to make sure that uh, we uh, maintain the safeguards that we have in place uh, that, that give us a great deal of security and uh, assurance that our elections are um, uh, that are that the integrity is intact. You started your question though with uh, with um, one billion dollars in dark money, and so I have forty five seconds left. I want to talk a little bit about campaign finance. Um, over the years, serving in the House of Representatives, one of the most frequent frustrations that I heard from House colleagues running for re-election is my opponent never filed. Um, you know, my opponent has signs, my opponent has ads in the paper, uh, but nobody knows where my opponent is getting his or her money from. Um, and so I want to make sure that we do a better job in Vermont of ensuring compliance with campaign finance disclosures, because Vermonters want to know who's paying for their elections. Thank you. Brooke. Give me the initial question, because I'm... I'm, on, I'm, I'm you followed up on the little tangent there. So what Absolutely. was the initial question? So the initial question is, do we need to improve our cybersecurity measures to limit foreign interference with elections? Very good. I think in a little tiny Vermont that, um, that we are far off the radar of terrible uh, influences from Russia or China or, or the Ukraine or wherever, I, th I think. The most important factor that we have going for us in our elections is we're still basically running a manual system. Yes, in big towns we have tabulators to, to add up the vote instead of making everybody add them up by hand. But in the end, all, that data only goes as far as a CF card that's in the side of the tabulator. 
from there on, it's all handled not over the internet, but manually. And so we don't, there's no opportunity for interference in my mind. The only concern I've had in, is during the primary, apparently, once it gets to the Secretary of State's office, it's then being transmitted out of state to New Hampshire, where, at least in the primary this time, something went very wrong, and it took them over a week to come up with the, uh, to, before they could have the canvassing committee meetings in order to give the results. Um, you know, so, like I said, I think as long as we stay with, we're a small state. You know, the whole state has population of less than that of Boston, for crying out loud, quarter the size of Philadelphia. And so I think that us remaining with um, paper ballots, and I think also importantly, maybe we get back to more of voting on Election Day. Thank maybe you, make Bert. Election Day a state holiday. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to move back to talking about the archives. Okay. Um, and we'll start this question with you, Brooke. Um, the Secretary of State oversees the Vermont archives and record requests. Um, I understand um, the original Vermont Constitution is among those archives. Um, several states have or are creating a public records ombudsman office to deal with issues. I might have I might have confused the issues with archives. Yes, and records requests. Um, do you believe this public records ombudsman office is needed in Vermont? to oversee state compliance with records requests. Okay. Why or why I'm not? I'm going to take your two parts and try to put them together here. First of all, as far as our archives, I do a lot of research. And so I've been up to the archives numerous times. Back when I was doing research on school mergers and things, I was involved in, in the records from uh, the time of the Brigham decision and Act 60. And those records were all stored in the basement of the Redstone Building and are all infected with or infested with mold. And so when you go up there to deal with them, the first time you come back, nobody tells you this. And so you come back with a bad case of rash on your arms and hands and whatever. And so next time you are smart enough to take some Benadryl and slather some on your arms to keep that from happening. Um, so there's problems in archives as far as things being uh, tended to. More recently, I had to go and get my state charter for my little town of Washington. And we're... One of, I think, 16 towns that still has its original 1777 charter signed by Thomas Chittenden. And so I went up there. They bring this nice box out. They open the box, and here is this tattered volume with a disintegrated leather cover. And as they're par parting the pages trying to find the Washington town charter, the pages are just basically separating. And, and so they scanned a copy for me neatly closed it back and put it away. But I fear that many of other documents, you know, these are just the ones I happen to come in contact with, aren't being treated much better. And so I think it would be important to restore the volumes we have. I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to run another second. But also importantly, to have all the documents scanned so they're readily available instead of being tucked away up in Middlesex. Thank you, Brooke. Yep. And Paige, if you would like 10 extra seconds for this question, oh, you I can won't, I won't take okay. 10 extra seconds. All right. I'm just um, going to repeat it for the audience. OK, sure. Um, the question is, um, do you think Vermont needs a public records ombudsman office to oversee state compliance of public records requests? Yes. Um, I do support that concept. Uh, and, and I support it because I have seen uh, many times over the years that uh, somebody who, uh, who believes that uh, they've not been given the information they want from, their, from uh, a state agency or a, a municipal entity uh, has only recourse they have is to take uh, that entity to court, which is a very intimidating thing for an ordinary citizen. I think an ombuds office would, um, would go a long way to helping make sure that we have best practices in place so that um, public records requests are being acted on in a timely manner. Uh, and I think it will improve transparency um, and also probably make it easier for the, uh, the entity who's holding the records um, to produce it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about mail-in ballots, which I heard you referenced earlier, Brooke, and we'll start. I, I lost track of who starts first. Um, I think you would start first for this one. Thank you, Sarah. Um, OK, so the state authorized mail-in voting in an attempt to slow the transmission of COVID-19 
while ensuring stronger voter participation. The question is, should mail-in voting be an option in all Vermont elections, um, including town meetings and primaries? And Sarah. So um, I have been really impressed with how, uh, how positively Vermonters have embraced mail-in ballots. Um, I think that Vermonters recognize that having a little more time with your ballot and the ability to, to research um, for a few weeks and mull over your choices is a, is a really good thing. There's a couple of challenges, though, with, uh, with extending universal vote by mail to either local elections or primaries. Um, I'll take local elections first. Many of our communities in Vermont do not do ballot voting for their town meeting. So they elect their select board and their other local officials. They adopt their budget. Um, they, they oftentimes debate and amend their budget right from the floor of town meeting. Town meeting is a really precious um, uh, uh, opportunity for Vermonters to participate in direct democracy. And I have seen so many times that people's minds have been changed. My mind has been changed in town meeting because I listened to my neighbors talk about whether they wanted to do something or not. Um, if we institute a, a, you know, a heavy-handed Montpelier-based edict that we go to, to uh, mailing those ballots, we will have done away with town meeting. I don't want to do that without Vermonters engaging in that question and saying, yes, that's the way we want to go. Thank you. Brooke. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that any of the discussion that I've heard uh, out and about was calling on mandating universal vote by mail for, for state, uh, for um, town and local elections. I think it, at, at best there was a discussion about making it optional, and I think it's currently under the law optional to those towns, but the town would make that decision. Uh, universal vote by mail uh, for our statewide elections has not been the wonderful embraced uh, activity that uh, Sarah would lead you to believe. There's thousands, tens of thousands of people who are very distressed about it and the fact that the ballots are being mailed everywhere. I have people sending me uh, information back or physical copies back uh, or images of their ballots that they've moved to St. Louis. And the post office, instead of being instructed by the Secretary of State, you know, if undeliverable, return to sender, has been forwarding these ballots all over the place. I mean, I've seen, of the people I know, five people who have moved away and their ballot caught right up with them. Sadly, three of them caught up with them before mine even made it to my house in Washington, Vermont. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. But, uh, you know, and they all have the nice, neat little yellow forwarding sticker from the post office. And... Um, as I said, the earlier you vote, and Sarah really almost made the, the point about town meeting, the earlier you're voting, the less information you have. Just like her comment about town meeting, the statewide elections on election day, that's the day people should be coming to the polls to make their decision. And if, you know, if they have problems and want to vote early or vote absentee, good to go. But a majority of people should not be, re, you know, wind up with their Thank balance you. early. Thank I know you, Brooke. Over. Sarah, because, uh, Brooke, you did mention, you used the phrase that Sarah led you to believe, yes. I would like to offer you 30 seconds to rebut, Thank if you, you would like to. Thank you, yes. Um, so, <laughs> there's so much going on there, I'm not sure how to, <laughs> how to fit it to 30 seconds. Um, so, I, you know, this idea that, um, that, that there's something wrong with forwarding somebody's ballot who has moved is, you know, is, is frankly putting in, in front of a legal voter a barrier that doesn't need to exist. You know, I, I think that the, uh, by and large, Vermonters are, um, are really pleased with the ability to sit down with their ballot. And, um, and yes, we have some work we can do to, to clean up our checklist and make sure that it's more responsive. Um, but I, I think universal vote by mail has been a success. Thank you. Brooke, and we're going to start. I think we're really, okay, I'm, I'm, you're, you're right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Thank you. We're, so we're going to, um, uh, we're going to start this question with you. Okay. And this actually, this question came from a um, debate or a forum, rather, that you were in in 2018 when you ran for Secretary of State okay. then. 
Um, and in that uh, forum, then Sec well, Secretary of State Jim Condos um, said that he believes there should be a national voting day, the same way we in Vermont um, have town meeting day as a holiday for some people, not for everybody. Um, do you think there should be a statewide voting day um, holiday um, similar to town meeting day that would enable people who work um, or who can't get to the polls for other reasons to um, to go out and vote? Yeah, I've openly said on numerous occasions that I think that election day should be a state holiday in Vermont without question. Now. That's not, everybody's not going to get the day off, obviously. Uh, people have wind up working on Christmas Day for crying out loud. But understand that it would focus attention on Election Day. Of course, if you have universal vote by mail, that makes less sense. And I'm not really in favor of continuing universal vote by mail. In 2019, Vermont was, Vermont's elections were judged to be the most accessible and the most secure in the country. And this, with our um, no excuse early and absentee voting, and the laws that we have to permit uh, the handicap and the homebound to request the justices of the peace to come to their home to assist them in voting, uh, we we certainly have the most ex had the most accessible voting process even before universal vote by mail. Universal vote by mail has just created. Issues and remember we were talking about people having confidence in the election one thing that it has done is given a lot of people less confidence as they envision 440,000 ballots papering the countryside being dropped in piles in the vestibules and lobbies of apartment buildings and uh, dorms and uh, Just all sorts of other mischief going on. I'm out Thank of time. You, Brooke. Thank you, Sarah could you repeat the question? Yeah, I was wondering. I was wondering if you would want me to do that. Um, now I've lost it in my papers here. Do you think we should enact a statewide voting day or a holiday for general elections, similar to town meeting day? Thank you. Um, yeah, the the challenge with that is always that um, not everybody has that day off, um, because even your grocery store and your gas station. Um, is open on uh, on holidays that are much more universally um, observed than town meeting day. Uh, I think what what we should think about if we're going to have that conversation in Vermont is looking at what some other countries do, which is that they have voting day on a Sunday, when many, if not most, businesses are already closed, um, and so it makes it uh, easier for uh, people to be able to take advantage of that voting day. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind the audience that we are taking live call-in um, questions. And if you would like to, leave the numbers up on the screen. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so now moving on, this next question, I'll start with Sarah. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time here. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, talk to me about the importance of the Secretary of State's office functioning as a nonpartisan entity. So, you know, there are a lot of um, aspects of the Secretary of State's duties that are, are, are very ministerial, um, technical, nonpartisan. Um, and so, as far as how the office functions, it needs to, off it needs to function in um, a neutral, nonpartisan way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Office of Professional Regulation, uh, since that's the one division that we haven't gotten to yet, um, and talk a little bit about the, the, the function of professional regulation is really at its base about protecting public health and public safety. Now, I don't need to be an expert tattooist in order to, uh, to be able to be the Secretary of State um, and assemble a, a, a board or an advisory committee of people in that profession who can help keep those uh, regulations up to date and can indeed evaluate them to make sure that we are um, doing the, the lowest level of regulation that is necessary for public health. But I don't think you want to imagine doing away with regulating amusement park rides. Um, we can all imagine the, the you know, terrible tragedy of, um, of uh, a poorly maintained amusement park ride. Um, tattooists 
uh, dental uh, hygienists, nurses, all of these folks um, uh, play very important and critical roles in our lives, and we want to make sure that we have a base level of um, public health and public safety in mind as we offer licenses. Thank you. Brooke, the question is, uh, talk to me about the Secretary of State's office functioning as a non-partisan uh, entity. Okay. Well, there's many, uh, there's several offices in, in the statewide election that are really ministerial positions, treasurer, auditor of accounts, um, even attorney general, as well as secretary of state. And I think our, our current secretary of state has gotten a little bit too partisan on numerous occasions, uh, lashing out at, at um, uh, uh, the last president, uh, making other remarks uh, supportive of the opponents of uh, Ju Justice Kavanaugh. And those kinds of things are out of place for the person that's responsible. One of primary responsibilities is chief uh, election official. One other thing that dawns on me, I talked to a couple of town clerks just yesterday. Many of the town clerks are upset that the Secretary of State has kind of imposed himself as the, the principal election official statewide and in their town. They view that it's their responsibility and duty to be sending out the election, uh, the ballots, regardless of whether they have to send them out to everyone or merely on request. Um, the other thing, I just have a few seconds left. I do want to address the, the issue about um, uh, the OPR and the expanse of its reach. I'm not saying that these folks shouldn't be regulated, merely that, especially in the healthcare profession, that maybe the Department of Health would be Thank you, better, better uh, uh, equipped to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm no, trying no, to get no, better no. at that uh, timing. Um, so um, we'll start this next question with you, Brooke. Okay. Um, what, in your view, are the elements of the duties of the Secretary of State's office that may need improvements or strengthening? And how would you go about doing it? Oh, Lord, in a minute and a half. That's like impossible. <laughs> As I've said, I think we need a good, strong look at elections. Many of the things that we did as a result of COVID, which were supposed to only be temporary emergency orders, um, have now been morphed into permanent uh, changes. And everything from universal vote by mail to how we're treating the drop boxes and, and, and vote harvesting, which are the two evil stepchildren of universal vote by mail, um, are, are really problematic. As I've said, OPR, I think, needs a good looking over and to try to find out how to scale it back. Another problem is that Secretary Condos was real big on making everything paperless, you know. And there's many people that are in commerce, many business owners and, and professionals who aren't really up to speed on, you know, on paperless, on, on the computer age. And I've talked to a lot of people who have, who have lost and then had to fight to get their um, fictitious aliases and, and their, their business licenses back because they thought they were getting notices in the mail. We're never told otherwise. And then suddenly, you know, they're, they're not out of compliance. And so I, I think we need a, 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 a professional to come in and look, you know, take a uh, global view of that office and figure out what's going on. I've already mentioned about uh, archives and the troubles there and, and restoring the historic documents. And, more, and just as importantly, uh, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sarah, um, do you need, would you like me to repeat the no, question? Okay. No, I'm okay. raring to go. In fact, okay. I think I'm going to buy us back a little bit of time here because a lot of the things that I'm going to list again are, are things that we've already talked about tonight. Um, uh, you know, I think by and large the Secretary of State's office is very well respected. Um, and Jim Condos has done a great job of making sure that we have made improvements along the way. Um, what are the elements that need strengthening? Um, I think the voter guide is, uh, is an important part of strengthening our democracy. I think it goes hand in hand with uh, the advances of uh, universal vote by mail. Um, that education and outreach coordinator who will be informed by a group of um, people in the teaching profession, how do we 
help create civics for young people, and then how do we also take that to adults in our communities? Cybersecurity focus, make sure that we're asking for good feedback, good advice, kicking the tires every single day, and that town clerk advisory committee um, so that we have a good link between the local communities who keep their own archives um, and um, conduct their own elections and the Secretary of State's office. Thank you. We got a call-in question, so I'm going to move to that. Um, and we'll start with Sarah and then go to Brooke. I'm um, seeing this for the first time. So, um, Okay, the question is, it was mentioned that there are cities that are less civilized. What makes these cities less civilized in terms of the election? Uh, can I offer an interpretive moment? I think that when we were talking about the fact that politics in Vermont is very civil compared to maybe the politics in Philadelphia, I forget the other towns I mentioned, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, where elections becomes a real uh, right. okay. adversary so sport. In that context, I'm going to ask the timekeeper, we're going to start with Sarah for this, um, to restart the clock for Sarah. So that's the context. That makes more sense. Okay, so why would those, um, what, the question is, what makes those other cities outside of Vermont less civil with their elections than Vermont? Or oh, do they, are boy. they? You know, I think, I think what it comes down to um, is what's unique about Vermont is that we, um, we have a, a live and let live attitude. And, and part of that comes from, you know, we're all bearing down to try to make it through the cold of winter. You know, if you need a cup of sugar, you know you can run up to my house and, and borrow a cup of sugar. Um, but you also know that even if we disagree on politics and, and you have a red flag and I have a blue flag, you know that, uh, that, that if you're stuck in a snowbank, I'm going to help you get out in the dead of winter. And, and so, you know, in Vermont, we still do greet each other as human beings first. I may not agree with your politics. You may not agree with mine, but we're, uh, but we're humans and, and Vermonters first. Okay. You know, I, I think that politics in Vermont and politics in some of these other cities that we've talked about are worlds apart. We saw on election night 2020, uh, the, the folks that were supposed to be observing for the parties, having pieces of plywood put up against the windows so they couldn't view the opening and processing of ballots. We saw people in parking lots filling out ballots and and all sorts of mischief. And I think we should thank our lucky stars that we don't have that kind of incivility in our election process. And I guess that's about it, that you know, just we're, we're very blessed to have a uh, degree of uh, camaraderie, if you like, in the um, operation of our elections. And, and bless, blessings that we have our wonderful town clerks and boards of civil authority who are from both parties, yet work together to make sure elections go smoothly. Thank you. Looks like we're getting a couple more call-in questions, and we still have more time. So the next one, we'll start with you, Brooke, for this one. Okay. If mail-in ballots and early voting was scaled back, how would you ensure everyone, especially those that are systematically and historically marginalized, has somewhere close to vote and lines aren't too long? I think in Vermont, we, you know, we have... Uh, uh, over 300 and some odd polling places. Obviously, every there's 252 now towns, so every town has at least one polling place, and many have multiple polling polling places. So I think polling places are convenient f for everyone. For those that are, it is un is not in uh, convenient either because of location or because of their work requirements and things. Even if we got rid of universal vote by mail, we still have the fallback of our early and absentee voting where and, and unlike sending them all over the place you know uh, papering the countryside if you like with the system we had up until 2019 there's a chain of custody you call your town clerk and ask for a ballot the town clerk now knows you're expecting the ballot and you know that she's sending you one you get it and then she's expecting its return so there, there there's no question about where that ballot's gone and where it came back to. 
Uh, beyond that, as I said before, we also have a secondary process for, for shut-ins and, and, and people that have handicaps to prevent them from getting to the polling place, of calling the town clerk or the Board of Civil Authority and asking that the Justice of the Peace be sent out, two of them, one from each party, and that they bring the ballot. If you need assistance in filling out the ballot, they assist you in filling it out, and then they return it to the polling place. I, I don't think we have a problem here in Vermont Thank with you. people being able to vote. Thank you. Sarah, how would you answer that question? Um, so when we enacted universal vote by mail in 2020, we did it um, primarily out of a concern for public health. Um, we didn't want people to have to choose between possibly being exposed to a pandemic virus um, and being able to conduct elections. When we came back with more time and in being able to reflect on the 2020 um, election and those successes, we really came at it with a, with a lens to let's make sure that this is the, the best answer for Vermont. And so we looked at all of the issues that, uh, that Mr. Page has talked about around um, ballot drop boxes and uh, you know, papering the countryside, <laughs> if, if that's the right phrase that you used. Um, and, uh, and we really wanted to make sure that elections were accessible to everyone, um, and, and particularly people who, are, uh, who have been historically marginalized. Who are those people in Vermont? Um, well, they're, they're, they're people who maybe English is not their native language. Uh, they are people who are working two jobs and, you know, maybe they have to rush from one job to the next and they can't get to uh, the town hall on election day or they can't turn their ballot in in person. They need the convenience of that after hours drop box. And so, you know, if you live in a democracy, you believe that everybody should have a vote. And Thank that's you. what we were focused on. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have one more call in vote. Uh, call in question, and it looks like Jen is still typing it. It might be finished. Um, and after that, then we'll move to your closing statements. Um, and Sarah, we'll start with you for this. Um, the question is, disabled people could contact, this is a quote, I think they're quoting okay. you. Yep. Disabled people could contact him and he could help them fill out the form, was said by one of the candidates. Um, and the question is, do they realize that effort and the lack of dignity. And it sounds like he is, well, this is a comment, it's not a question, so I'll leave that part out. Um, so Sarah. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we need to stop and put ourselves in the shoes of, um, of somebody with uh, some sort of disability and, um, and ask, would we feel comfortable stepping up and saying, no, I want to exercise my right to vote I don't care if I'm inconveniencing you because you have to bring me the ballot. Um, there are so many uh, organizations out there that are helping states uh, compare best practices in terms of how to um, provide ballot access to people with visual imperities, uh, people with physical imperities, uh, and we need to make sure that we are adopting those. And, you know, it's not always easy for, for some of our small towns to make those accommodations, but if there's anything that we can do from the Secretary of State's office to give that ballot access to folks, I want to make sure that we're pursuing that. Thank you. Brooke. Yeah, um, the tone of the question seemed to be that by ha having the ability of, of shut-ins and handicapped uh, folks uh, being able to request folks to come out and assist them with their ballot was somehow demeaning. And I think that's far from the intent of the law or, or the intent of the justice of the peace that are involved. Uh, uh, envision a, a blind person. We don't have braille ballots. And so the current only way that that's handled is the Secretary of State has sent out to every town, and I don't, maybe sometimes got more than one, but it looks like a little uh, game console where the person's supposed to come in and they, ha they press one of three little buttons and the thing is interactive with them. I know my town of Washington got one and the only person that's ever used it is the assistant town clerk to test it out. It's never been used and it's my understanding in many towns that these, this wasn't used. Whereas the justice of the peace, one from each party, goes to the homes of the blind, the physically impaired, and lets them fill out their ballot. 
And if they're unable to is when the, the two justice of the peace in concert will assist that person in filling out their ballot. There's nothing demeaning about this. It's, it's, you know, it, it's something that we're treating the, uh, uh, the blind and the handicapped and the shut-ins with, with a great degree of dignity in allowing them to be, or, or making sure that they're able to vote. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, our timekeeper, uh, the timing got a little off. Um, <laughs> no, you didn't. I think it didn't reset. Um, thank you very much, both of you. Um, we are now at the close of the program, so I'd like to eat, give you each a minute for your closing statement or if there's anything that you would have liked to have had addressed that didn't happen. And we'll start with you, Brooke. A minute is a very short time, so I, I don't think I'll address the shortcomings of, of our discussions. Um, my name is Brooke Page, and I'm from the town of Washington, Vermont, and I very much look forward to being your next Secretary of State if, if you privilege me with your, with your vote and, and elect me. Uh, I'm con there's concerns, there's problems across the Secretary of State's office, but they're not problems that can't be addressed and resolved. And that's really what I want to do. I don't, I'm not looking at this as being some sort of stepping stone to higher office. I have no, uh, I'm 70 years old for crying out loud. And, and, you know, a couple years or maybe two terms in the Secretary of State's office is m as much as I think it would be necessary to resolve the issues that I see in that office. And then I will happily go on to my somewhat belated uh, retirement Thank you for having me here tonight. And Thank I you. look forward to seeing other people down the road. Thank you, Brooke. Sarah. So thank you so much for having us tonight. This has been a great conversation. Um, I, I think just in closing, I, I want to say I'm really excited to bring my 18 years of uh, public service experience to the role of the Secretary of State's office. I've led on many of the most complicated and complex issues that have come through the legislature in recent years, including um, sexual harassment legislation, modernizing our sexual assault statutes, uh, making sure that uh, first responders have post-traumatic stress coverage uh, when they get an injury um, coming to our rescue, and uh, of course on climate action. And these are complex and thorny issues that I think are, um, are most appropriately resolved in a robust democracy. And that's why I'm so excited to shift my focus to the Office of Secretary of State uh, to make sure that we continue to have uh, free, fair, and accessible elections, to make sure that our office runs smoothly and gives good customer service to Vermonters. Thank you. Sarah Copeland Hansis, Brooke Page, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Um, and to our audience, um, Election Day is November 8th. And you should have received your ballot in the mail by now. If you haven't received one, call your town clerk or city clerk. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, the best thing you can do to protect our democracy is go out there and vote. Good night. <laughs>